Good evening, good evening. Welcome to the International Spy Museum. I'm Amanda Olke, Director of Adult Education here, and we are delighted to have you with us for Queen of Cuba with Peter J. Lapp. Wonderful book. Woo! Tonight, Dr. Andrew Hammond, our historian and curator, will be interviewing Pete about his book by the same name and Pete's experience co-leading the investigation into Ana Montez. Montez was a trusted defense intelligence agency analyst when she was arrested in 2001. Pete's perspective on the case is drawn from his time as a special agent for the FBI who retired after 22 years either investigating or managing counterintelligence investigations involving Cuba, Russia, and China. Not very important places, right? <laughs> oh, wow. <gasps> Many visitors to the Spy Museum over the last 21 years of our existence have told us their stories about working alongside Montez. Not working with her as a spy, but having her work alongside them uh, in their office. Did you by any chance get a copy of her cheesecake recipe when you came in? That was brought to a previous program by a former colleague of hers. Um, also, um, there are people who are living in the same building as Montez when the net of surveillance closed in around her. I see you sitting down there in the second row. So this is a uniquely local story with incredible global relevance. I'm really looking forward to Andrew's questions for Pete. And after Andrew finishes his interview, we invite you to come to the standing microphones on either side of the room to ask questions. You're probably going to be tempted to ask from your seat, but we really want to capture your questions so everyone can hear. And we're also making a recording. So you don't want to hear any more from me. You want to hear from Andrew Hammond and Pete Lapp. Thank you. I got to grab my bubbly water here. Oh. So it's a pleasure to be speaking with you tonight, Pete, uh, and I really enjoyed reading your book. So I should probably introduce uh, Pete first, um, retired FBI special agent, uh, 22 years, uh, served in two different Pennsylvania police departments. Uh, a National Guard infantry officer, uh, and then since he's left the FBI, besides being an author, uh, you have your own consulting firm. So it's a pleasure to speak to you. I just thought the very first place that I would like to start, can you take us back to that moment when you're waiting for Anna Montes to come and you know that you're going to arrest her? What 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 was that like? Because you're only yeah. you're only, you're not that long in the bureau at this right. point, and you're waiting there, and you you must have some sense of the significance of the case. Like, were you exhilarated? Were you uh, were you angry? Like, yeah. help us understand like what that was like for you to be closing in on the on the hunt. So the context is: it's ten days after nine eleven. It's three weeks after my son was born, Ethan. He was actually due September 15th, 2001. He came on August 26th. Imagine if he had come on his due date, halfway between September 11th and September 21st. The night before we made the arrest, I, I, I told my wife, I said, my wife at the time, I said, hey, so tomorrow I'm going to make a big arrest. It's going to be a big deal. I might have said other things. We've been tracking, the reason I've been so distracted for the past 10 months or so is because we've been tracking um, a woman that we are about to arrest for espionage, but I can't tell you her name as if she would have told anyone anyway. And uh, she's like, that's great. Ethan's crying. Can you go get him? So uh, I thought it was a big deal. Like, this is going to be a big deal. You're going to see this on TV. And and it's, it's an interesting because we... 
in the FBI code name cases like this, and Anna's code name was Blue Wren, completely unsexy, un neat kind of code name, just completely random. And up until that moment when she walked in the room, it's almost like her name became forgotten because it was always Blue Wren. Anytime we talked about her, we talked to her about her and her code name. In that moment, it was about to change because it was like, hi, Blue, I mean, hi, Anna, Pete Lapp, nice to meet you, Steve McCoy, nice to meet you. It became overt in that moment. And the, the knowledge, knowing that she was not going to walk out of there free was was kind of humbling, to be honest with you. When you have this power that the FBI has and law enforcement has to take away people's liberty, you know, she was going to jail that night. And it, I can remember feeling the heaviness of the moment. I thought that we were going to get a confession. I had a little bit of ego going in that moment where I, in my vast, and I'm saying that with sarcasm, <laughs> vast experience in law enforcement, seven years by that point in time, we had followed her. I had been in her apartment legally um, a number of times. We read every email. You know, the only thing we couldn't do was read her mind, and I never had ever been about to talk to someone who I had known so much about. And the reality was that she was more prepared to meet us than either Steve or I were ready to meet her. She had been planning for this day for 17 years, I'm convinced, and knew what she was going to say if she met the FBI on our terms and not hers. So from lawyer, from hello to lawyer, took all of four minutes. And if you need to get anyone to lawyer up, which, by the way, is not the goal, give me a call. I'm, I'm actually really good at it. But the surrealness, the surrealness, I got Kendall Myers to lawyer up pretty quick, too, which is I'm 0 for 2 in my confession. I won't be writing a book about how to get a confession. Um, but, no, it was surreal because you knew at this point in time it was going to be historic and, and noteworthy and Importantly, you knew not just her life was going to change, but her family's life was going to change. And that weighed heavily on Steve and I, knowing that, that their family was about to get news that was going to break their heart. And it was breaking our hearts as well as we were kind of building up to that moment. And I, can, I know for a fact I was feeling the weight of how they were about to find out that their sister was betraying our country and their family. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to go on to discuss a little bit more who Ana Montes is, is for the people here that don't know who, who she is like more generally. But I was just wondering, that case coming so early in your career, mm -hmm. I know from reading the book that you're inside, you're really a New Jersey hair band uh, rock and roll, <laughs> rock and roller. Uh, was, was there a sense like during the course of your career, and of course you had a a long and successful career, but was there ever a sense that I, I came out with slippery when wet or uh, born to run right at the beginning and then, <laughs> you know, like normally normally there's a build-up? Like, because you, you've mentioned that this was a career case. Yeah. Can you tell yeah. the, the listeners who haven't been in the FBI what a career case means? I mean, a career case is a case that people talk about um, f forever. It defines your career. I want to say that I represent all the men and women of the FBI, of the DIA, of, and I can finally say this publicly. I've never been able to say this publicly until I did this, the National Security Agency. You know, no such agency. And then another agency that asked me not to, they, they got redacted from it. But this is a team effort. There's a lot of people that deserve credit for it. I'm fortunate to be doing this, but I, I can't catch a cold, let alone a spy. And without the help of all these folks from a variety of different agencies, we all brought a lot of different talents and parts to, to this story. It, it, it really, for me, um, was, was just a moment where I knew, I kind of felt the historicalness to it, um, knowing it, Hansen had been arrested that February. So we knew the enormity of an espionage investigation. And I think that because of 9-11, the general American public doesn't know about Anna. Um, 
it's funny. I've 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 had the book out for sale at gigs where I'm playing, and there was one a couple people in particular who would see the book, and you can't. It doesn't say Anamantas, and they look at that and they go, "Oh, that's Anamantas," and they know her like that. And I'm like, "Well, how? Just curious. How do you know about this?" And she said, they, "These people would say I work for the government, and she's part of our annual security training <laughs> every year. I mean, they know her, and it's funny because Anna." Anna would would has said in her statement, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, these people who are who are ruminating about me should should, and it's like you don't understand when you before you got arrested, you would listen to stories about Aldrich Ames and John Walker, and now you're since you've been arrested, people are hearing about you. That's why you are significant, and that's why people talk about you. So. It, it is humbling to say that, you know, this was a career case for me and just and, – and, but, like, so many other people were involved with it. Trust mm-hmm. me. It, it just was not more than just me or Steve. And give, a, give our listeners a, a pen portrait of Anna Montes. Who was she? Tell them a little bit more about her. So Anna is a, a Puerto Rican by descent, born in Germany because her father was in the military, oldest of four, uh, grew up uh, a very proud Puerto Rican and – um, went to UVA as an undergrad studying international affairs. Very intelligent woman. Very smart woman. Um, can have empathy towards the right folks uh, or towards the folks that she believe are right. Um, Olds of four and, and, and then went to Johns Hopkins not too far from here back when they were up on Massachusetts Avenue and was getting her master's degree in international affairs and, and was someone who while she's at Johns Hopkins, was working at the Department of Justice. You'll read in the book, um, The Onion has this joke that I steal, saying the U.S. government has just realized it's been using black highlighters all these years. <laughs> so there's some black highlighting in the book. Anna was in the FOIA office, the Freedom of Information office at DOJ, and this was a low-level position. She was applying the black highlighters to name checks that people would re- spend in. And her goal was to finish her master's degree and go work at Amnesty International or Human Rights Watch doing good throughout the world. And and we need folks to do that. And then that's when she met the Cubans and life changed for her at that point in time. And talking about the Cubans... um this week, obviously, a big story has broken, and we I hadn't get, heard. <laughs> yeah, <I'm, laughs> uh, we can do tell. We can get into that a little bit later, yeah. but uh, it's quite interesting looking at this case. Uh, so we have Anna Montes, University of Virginia, and uh, the School of Advanced International Studies at Hopkins. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have Marta Velasquez, uh, Georgetown, and then Sice. We have Kendall Myers, uh, Yale. Harvard and uh, SAIS. He's a professor there. Sure. Sorry if there's any SAIS graduates in the audience. What, what the heck was going on at SAIS? <laughs> uh, you know, it's a good question. I think, I think in that era, and if we can throw, we might as well throw Ambassador Roca in. Um, should I, should, does he still earn the title of ambassador? Um, you know, I think, I think just in that mindset in academic uh, circles in that time frame, People seem to be gravitating towards views, worldviews that were in contrast to, for, for Anna, you know, under President Reagan, he had a very controversial foreign policy vis-a-vis El Salvador and Nicaragua. A lot of people disagree with that, not just, not just you know, left-wing folks, all, all sorts of people. And that vehement opposition to that policy fit into her perspective of, for example, her view that Puerto Rico should be independent or at least not be controlled by the United States. And then let's transfer that to Cuba. And then we're going to transfer that to El Salvador, Nicaragua. So it's this general non-interventionist attitude that Anna has that um, I think draws her to, to become spotted by Marta and then, and then to, to the Cubans as well. And tell us when you first got assigned to this case. So I know that you get, uh, surprisingly, you get this phone call, you're going to work counterintelligence, yep. you're going to work uh, the, the, the Cuban um, the Cuban uh, part in the Washington field office. Yep. Uh, how do you first come onto the Ana Montes case? Was it already on the docket when you went to that, to that unit or was it something that eventually came your way? 
So, so when I got to the Cuban counterintelligence squad, I was really moody, like more moody than normal for those of you folks that know me. I was really grumpy because it's like, what is counterintelligence? What's our goal? Do we get to use our handcuffs? No, no, no. You don't really arrest people. Like, wh what do we do? And, and then, um, so this is September of 1998. We started doing some things that were pretty cool, one or two of which I was able to write in a book because they were public, most of which I couldn't write about. And wouldn't want to. And then we had been, our squad had been working a number of unsub cases, unknown subjects. We had a series of intelligence successes far back as 1994. And we got some intelligence sparks that I referred to that showed that we had a lot of problems, a lot of people in the United States both here illegally and then legal Americans who were working for our government, whether it was at the State Department or uh, the intelligence community, you know, non-intelligence non community or intelligence community. And the government's asked me not to say how many, but I need to put this in context and emphasize because after the fact, I think there's a lot of uh, peanut gallery folks that are like, you should have all caught them earlier. We had a lot of cases, not just one person, and there was no names associated with those folks. So we spent our time kind of moonlighting, trying to figure out these unsub cases, and that's when um, I knew of them. I hadn't, didn't have any of them assigned to me. Some of the other agents on the squad did. And then the Christmas party of 2000, I'll remember it you know, forever, where Steve McCoy, who was the senior case agent, he had had the unsub case, the unknown subject case, and he said, we're just talking at the, at the party, and he said, you know, we got a name for one of these cases. I said, oh, it's cool. And I, I might have given him some BS. I'll, I'll try and keep my swearing down, which is unusual. Um, you know, I, 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 had a more, I had a ham radio license as a kid, and he was, like, really impressed like da 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 did da 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 da, and I said, so I know all about the high frequency stuff, which was really BS. I knew nothing, but I was trying to sell him on the, hey man, can I work with you on this? And I think he and I, you know, we hit it off, and and he asked me to be the co-case agent. And that's the moment when I knew that we were going to partner together, but I still didn't get the enormity of how this was going to play out. So let's let's take a moment then to discuss the nature of a mole hunt. Yep. So, and the FBI, unsub, uh, John le Carre, mole hunt, uh, mm -hmm. spy hunt, whatever you want to call it. How, do, how does that all shake out? So you come onto the case, like, where do you begin? Like, how do you start narrowing it all down, you know, other yep. than reading Sherlock Holmes novels and, you know, coming up with... Uh, Ways in what you let can. me share. Let me let me share like the some of the what what do we what we knew. You know, it's hard. So Agent S, who becomes Montez, was being run out of the enemy services for Cuba M one two. I'll give you. The, I'll give you. I've done the math. The Cubans refer to the enemy services as the FBI, the CIA, and the entire Department of Defense. So FBI has thirty five thousand employees. CIA, I don't know for a fact, and if I knew, it would probably class be classified, but Wikipedia says 20,000, so I'll go with that. The Department of Defense has 1.3 million uniformed and 800,000 civilians, not including contractors. So just based on that little tidbit alone, our suspect pool went from 330 million people to 2.5 million people. Boy, what a what a break, you know. <laughs> that narrowed it down. Now, when you start taking the, the frequencies, the ranges, you would then know we're not looking at those agencies, those people from those agencies that are on the West Coast. They're not in Florida. They're not in Chicago. They're not in Guam. They're somewhere between New England and North Carolina. Okay, so that's what, 500,000 people? So we're, we're methodically working through to try and identify potential suspects in a very careful and cautious way. We have to. You know, this principle of need to know is, is super important. And I talk about how close the case was to being blown before either Steve or I or the FBI had ever really heard the name Anna Montes. 
and it was because of a over aggressive, you know, tenacious analyst who really got lucky and got Anna's voicemail and didn't reach her. So we methodically worked through, we anal- we analyze the tidbits, and we have to be. It's not fact, you know. For example, Sergio. Sergio was one of the as was the name that they referred to Anna as in the now decrypted, previously encrypted high frequency messages. What jumps out at you about Sergio? That's the name of a dude. And Anna is definitely a woman. So the Cubans referring to Anna by a man's name was intentional and deception and therefore provided us a, a reasonable doubt and, and the idea that we were probably looking for a man. And the Cubans obviously went to great lengths to disguise her gender because think of the population of men versus women in 2023 in the government. In that point in time, it's, it's much more you know 70% men, 30% women. So very difficult. We, we couldn't, you know, each data point that we knew, there were reasonable, like it could be this, it could be that. You're, you're speculating to a degree. It's almost like, a, a, a serial killer. And it's almost like the crime scene of a serial killer and trying to put together what you think you know and then apply it to a population of folks. And then, oh, by the way, try to make sure your serial killer or your spy doesn't find out about what you're looking for. And that almost happened with Anna, unbeknownst to us. And I find that really, uh, really fascinating. So is there, like in this process, is there a methodology that you use or the the FBI special agents use? Is there like a field manual for this type of mole hunt or is it it's passed down from one agent to the next? It's a bit more, you know, uh, you become an as an apprentice, you learn it up and you pass it on to someone else. Like help me understand how it's all, how that knowledge is banked and codified if at all. Yeah, definitely not a methodology, not something that you could take training on or it's given at the FBI. And I would say that, you know, we're collaborating with folks at NSA. We're collaborating with folks at FBI headquarters. We're collaborating with folks at that other agency that doesn't, that wants to stay redacted. It's really a team effort. And reasonable people will disagree. Well, that tidbit means this and that tidbit means that. So at the end of the day, if the decision has to be made, in these cases, espionage cases, the FBI should, should make that final decision as the lead counterintelligence agency for the United States. But it's really collaborative, and it's really kind of like getting in there and, and kind of you know mixing it up a little bit, and everyone from different agencies bringing their perspectives and views together to try to solve a very difficult problem to solve. And with that, reasonable people you know did disagree from time to time, but you know frankly, we didn't have the right team in the people in the room until the NSA analyst reached out to DIA on her own and brought them in. And it was an incredibly lucky break. Again, it almost blew the investigation, but um, we found the right person at DIA that knew something and matched a tidbit. And then away we went. Mm -hmm. And just before we get back to Anna proper, what's the, like for the FBI, what's the difference between counter-espionage and counter-intelligence. So a counter-espionage investigation, a counter-intelligence operation. And as does the way that the FBI think of them, does that also apply to how the CIA does counter-intelligence, for example? Well, so the FBI looks at... The FBI's counter-intelligence program is a broader, bigger program, and then counter-espionage is a part of that. I argue it's the more important part of that because we're looking at people that have a clearance, have access to classified information, and are passing that to someone who is probably under counterintelligence investigation or should be. Um, It's definitely the counterespionage program for the Bureau kind of falls on the, um, almost on the fence between counterintelligence and criminal, because you use both national security tools, like we used FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, to get legally in, national security letters, but we also could use subpoenas and, and, and criminal arrest warrants, whereas we're not going to arrest a diplomat, a Cuban diplomat who has diplomatic immunity, but we can ar- arrest a, a, a person like Ana Montes or uh, the ambassador you know, for espionage or espionage-related type charges. Mm-hmm. And I, I think... I think and that, one... By the way, that's the fun part. 
Okay. The counter espionage <laughs> part, that's the fun part because you Tell can us more. <laughs> actually use your handcuffs from time to time. And, and it's, that's part's really so, fun. So when you arrested Anna, I know that when you were in the, the police department, you pro- um, undoubtedly you arrested people. When you arrested Anna, was that the first time you used the handcuffs in the FBI? Yes. It was? Okay. And last time. First and last. Well, yes. Let, first, yeah. I mean, first time. But then when we would bring her back and forth to the prison to debrief, I think I would use, I don't think the marshals gave me their handcuffs. I think they uncuffed her and I used mine and then brought her back and forth. But mm-hmm. I think Anna's the only one that really ever used those handcuffs, mm-hmm. except my, my son-in-law who handcuffed himself accidentally by himself. <laughs> okay. And, and, and did we, he didn't realize I didn't have the key. He just assumed <laughs> That the FBI retired FBI agent who had cuffs also had the key, and we had it's to call the Leesburg Police Department and have him come. But anyway, it's another story. I shouldn't tell that story. So, so you eventually narrow it down to Anna Montez. You arrest her, and then you interrogate her, debrief her, etc. Like, what what kind of person did you did you meet? Was it someone that you thought? You know, I know you discussed this in the book, but the audience yep. don't have the benefit of having read the book like I do. So uh, what kind of person did you encounter? Was it someone you liked? Was it someone you disliked? Is it, was it someone who was arrogant? Someone who was, uh, you know, surprised you in some way? Is there a D, all the, all the above? All e, the above. All the above? Uh, I, I encountered a painful person to deal with. I look back on that time and I enjoyed the hunt and the building of the case. I enjoyed the Blue Wren phase of the case much more than I enjoyed the Anamanta sitting in a room trying to interact with her. It was just painful for me and torture for me and torture for her. That's the one thing I think we would agree on. Um, it just, she had such a condescending intellectually arrogant attitude and I and maybe I felt more of that as Steve being older I mean Steve could tell you the difference between the Sandinista and the Contra he knew the history I could care less didn't matter to me I'm not an international I'm a criminal justice major you know for better or worse but I know how to put people in jail so you know I I think she despised me and look down upon me in, in our interaction. And I will say I, I have evolved in my maturity. I do think I had a hard time. I was very professional, but I kind of wore my feelings on my sleeves. I mean, it's part of that, that Jersey thing where we just, we just kind of like let people know how we feel. And, and uh, it was just, she didn't want to do anything to do with small talk. You know, she didn't want to like build rapport and, and there were times where we weren't talking about her. We were just two human beings in a room just trying to kill time and taking a break. And my God, was that painful. And for her, too. I mean, I, you know, let's be honest. She wasn't living her best life, as, as they say right then. Mm-hmm. So difficult process. We had a job to do. She had a job to do. But, you know, we definitely didn't see eye to eye on a lot of different things. Mm-hmm. There's no Christmas card exchanging going on. <laughs> you don't stay in touch. <laughs> no, not so much. What well, just out of interest, what would you do if you saw her walking down the street, Pete? Would you would you cross the road or would you like I, I know you've said in the book that it took you a long time to work through hating her. Yeah. Uh like how, how do you feel now that she's released and so my hate for her, I, it's a good question. My hate for her was more in response to 9-11 and what she was going to do in Afghanistan. And it, it pisses me off. Uh, it still does to this day. You know, you can have your opinion about policy and all this, this other stuff. But after 9-11, there was no dissent in my mind. There's no dissension about what we were doing in Afghanistan. And to me, this is, what, this is quintessential Ana Montes and why she's the hypocrisy of her. She believed that she had, we had a right to invade Afghanistan in defense of 9-11. However, comma, she felt that she had a right to tell Cuba how we were going to fight that war. And she told me that if men and women died as a result of her intelligence, this is a whole hypothetical story, they took, that's the risk they took. And it's not her fault. 
And I, it just that just pissed me off. I mean, after 9-11, you know, we were sending men and women in harm's way to, to bring justice to them or, or bring them back to justice. And it's just un-American to me because it had nothing to do with Cuba. You're just, you're just anti-American if you're going to spy and provide information about what we're doing in Afghanistan after 9-11. So, yeah, that caused me the hater. I've, I've gotten to a point where I hate the sin and not the sinner. I, I, I feel like her what life was a waste. I mean, 39 years committed to this cause and then the punishment for this cause, I think, is a waste. Um, I don't think she really helped the Cuban people, but... You know, would I cross the street? Sure. Um, I'd say hello. I wouldn't be threatening in any way. And I, I would probably tell her, like, what I'm doing here is not to punish you. What I'm doing here is to prevent another you, to help share with people what you really did, the harm you did, and make sure people don't admire you and follow in your footsteps. That's my motivation with doing this not to add further punishment to her. I mean, she served her time. Mm -hmm. and, and just to briefly touch on that, so this is a question that's often asked when someone's uncovered, like why did it take so long? Yep. And that's something you address in the, in the book. And in fact, a journalist asked me this very question two days ago with regards to Ambassador yep. Rocha, like yep. how did this go on for 40 years? So you've uh, walked the walk like... T tell us about the difficulty of uncovering these or, or why it took so long. I mean, it's a legitimate question. If we're going to talk about the success of the arrest, the counterintelligence success, we've got to talk about the reality of the counterintelligence failure of it going on for so long. And I am not pointing fingers at any agency in particular. There's a shared success responsibility and a shared failure. These things go on for, I mean, 17 years is far too long. 40 years is far too long. And I think that there's just a lot of reasons, you know, and I, I, I don't want to come across as being defensive. The Cubans are that good. The Cubans are really, really good at finding individuals that, you know, say what you want about Anna and the crime she committed. I do think from a character perspective, I hold her in not as low regards as Bob Hansen. He's a slime ball. You know, Anna at least believed in something. Whether her and I agree it was the right thing, we're not going to. But she definitely believed in a cause greater than herself. So as a professional level of respect to that, to that dedication, I think in Anna's case, you know, she was near perfect. You know, she sometimes her views were known. Her sister Lucy had said that, you know, I knew broadly about my sister's world views, but I assumed her employer knew about it, and I assumed her employer didn't have any problem with it. And it's the United States of America. You're have to, allowed to have different views on different things. So that in and of itself doesn't make someone a criminal. Um, you know, the tidbits that we knew were so vague, maddeningly vague, and not specific. And how do we put together this mosaic and then go to the Department of Defense, for example, which has, you know, the 2 million employees and 44 different stovepipes of employees and HR and all that kind of stuff and security folks. It's just, it's really difficult. And I just, I know it's a valid question and it's a legitimate question. There's not an easy answer to it. Uh, you know, this guy, the ambassador became, you know, uh, he, voiced political views that were completely inconsistent with his own views, which probably caused people to say, well, how can he be a spy if he's, you know, very much pro-Trump and on that side of things? It doesn't make a lot of sense. So I think that there are folks that do things deliberately that help mask what they're really doing. This is a tough, tough business, and it's very difficult. And I, but I respect and appreciate the what took you so long question is mm -hmm. legitimate. And and just to just to follow up with that, you know, and I can't even imagine the the difficulty of narrowing this down, but just to follow up with that, you know, some people would maybe say, well, okay, so it's uh it, we're we're getting this particular type of information 
okay, sure, there's millions of people in the Department of Defence, but clearly it's not going to be someone in the 101st Airborne. So True. there's huge tranches of people yep. that can be cut out initially. Yep. So we're, we're actually starting from a much smaller number. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm just wondering if you had any thoughts about that, if someone came back at you saying, well, you know. Yeah, legitimate question. Um, you know, let's take out the 82nd Airborne. Let's take out most of the folks in the Marines. Let's take out, let's focus on people focusing on Cuba, for example. And then let's focus on the fact that Anna from 1985 to 1992 committed espionage to Cuba and for those seven years did not have an ounce of information of relation to Cuba. She was working El Salvador in Nicaragua. So she's spying to Cuba but providing them with intelligence about El Salvador and Nicaragua. So let's just say, well, we're looking for, if it's a Cuban spy, they got to have access to Cuban intelligence. Nope. Anna had stuff about El Salvador. Now, clearly, they're taking her, her intelligence about El Salvador and not reading it and going, wow, this is really fascinating. We're going to put it in a safe. Now, clearly, they're providing that to the Sandinistas and helping them out. But generally speaking, we if with that mindset, we'd be looking at individuals that have access to Cuba information and, and Anna didn't for the first seven years. So I'm not sure using that piece, she would have jumped out at us as someone who's mm -hmm. a Cuban spy because she's helping, she's working El Salvador, Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. um, kind of real quick to a point um, in that time frame, 1985 to 1992, and I have a photograph. Um, hold on. Work with me here. Bear with me. The family photograph. And, and it's Tito's graduation. Here we go. So Tito is on his brother on the far right. Joni's in the dress, flower dress. Uh, Joni is Tito's ex-wife, so Anna's ex-sister-in-law. Lucy's in the middle. Anna, and by the way, you have to laugh at this, okay? Black and white pinstripes. <laughs> foreshadowing a little bit come on hmm. um, and then Mr. Montez um, Alberto this is taken in in February of 1988 Tito is graduating from the FBI Academy the same academy I graduated and my, my peers graduated from I remember this day like it was yesterday you're, you're proud you are patriotic they finally gave you your gun and they're not going to lock it up like it's like take it with you as opposed to every day we would put our guns up in the safe thing, which is probably important. They give you your handcuffs, your creds, your badge. You are ready to go out and catch bad guys. Three people down is a bad guy. And she had been to Cuba twice, illegally and covertly by the time this photograph is taken. Six months before, she went to Cuba to get a medal. From Fidel. Now, schedules didn't align, and for whatever reason, she met with a guy named Jose Abarantes, who was the head of the Ministry of Interior, who was closer to Fidel than his own brother. Gets the medal. They take back the medal, and she's already at DIA, so she travels illegally and covertly, which from somebody who has a security clearance, that's really, really dangerous. We can't prove, but after that medal was presented, before that medal was presented, there was a Green Beret who was killed in El Salvador, Greg Feronius, and his camp was overrun, and he was killed a bunch with, uh, along with a bunch of Contras. And uh, we don't know, but I don't think the Cubans handed out a congratulations, Anna. This year, you're the number three ranked spy of the year. You know, this wasn't a bronze medal they gave her. This was, this was you know, significant. And we believe that she gave intelligence, but can't prove that led to the death of Greg Fronius while she's in, you know, after she's in this, before she's in this picture. And this is Tito's graduation. And it just, it just really aggravates me, this photograph, because he should remember this day proudly. And unfortunately, he, he has to look back on this and go, man, my sister, you know. Um, Lucy became a translator for our office in Miami the FBI office, and uh, both of them retired honorably. This is a good family. It's a really good family. This was Mr. and Mrs. Montez for their faults as parents, and we all, every parent has a fault. 
um, they raise their kids very morally. And the damage she's done to their family is, is really the unapologetic damage she's done to their family um, to this day is just really, uh, it's sad. I, th- I think it's, uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty incredible. Uh, w- w- one of the things that I was hoping to touch on, Pete, just to, could you give our, our audience a sense of the, the significance of the betrayal? Like she was the, 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 the queen of Cuba, you know, the, the, the Cuba person, a uh, uh, DIA. Um, how I know that she, she, I believe, briefed the president of Nicaragua at one point. She uh, done the first draft of an important uh, U.S. foreign policy document. So she's, the, the, you know, the damage is significant, right? Could you just give our uh, audience a, an understanding of how high she was in the hierarchy and the level of damage that she was able to do? Yeah, the best I can synopsize. So, yes, I mean, she had access to a lot of very sensitive intelligence and anything that was of real significance, she passed. I don't know that she was able to influence foreign policy. You know, she's a GS-15 analyst, you know, not a political appointee, not in the senior executive, um, very, very much a, a subject matter expert on Cuba uh, for the Department of Defense, very well respected professionally, not personally, but professionally amongst the Cuba, you know, community within the intelligence community. But I'll give you, I'll give you the most damaging non-human being intelligence that she passed, and I think, I think to me, it's mind-blowing. Uh, there's a special access program that belonged to the National Reconnaissance Office (NRO). I found it on her computer, and it's four sentences. And it's not what the intelligence was that came from that program. You know, NRO, National Reconnaissance Office, they do satellites. So it wasn't like, hey, this satellite on this date found this. Just the existence of the program. Um, She had been read into it, and it was death penalty evidence. And it was on her computer underneath her bed, deleted, we recovered it, and then it was on Fidel's desk. The National Reconnaissance Office, according as far as the American people knew, didn't exist until 1991. I mean, we're talking X-Files, right? Byman, the word for the clearance that she was read into. The government classified the word Byman secret. How do you classify a word? Uh, until 2004. That's how the great lengths that the government went to protect that information. And she read into it and was like, wow, this is really neat. And went home and typed it up. This is what I learned today. This is what this program does. I will say that she told me it's one of the only times she ever paused before she gave it to the Cubans because she knew how damaging she knew the significance of this information. I mean, it's pretty, you get right into this program, it's, it's a tight, tight group of people. And she knew how important it was. And then she calculated that if it's that important for the government, U.S. government, that it's that important for her to share that with the Cuban government. And it was, um, it's, never been, it's never been declassified. It's never been um, put out there publicly by the government and, you know, remains, as far as I know, you know, the details to it. And it was, it was death penalty eligible evidence, which unfortunately we couldn't use fully towards, towards the plea agreement. But that gives you a sense as to the kind of stuff that she has. That's the extreme, most sensitive information mm-hmm. she had. She gave. And help us understand the intricacies of this because, you know, she's an analyst, but she betrays CIA um, assets in Cuba. So, like, some people would say, well, why the heck does an analyst need to know their names? Like, why are they not just called red, yellow, blue, and white, like in Reservoir Dogs or something? Yeah. Like, why do you actually need to know who these people are? It's just the information that counts. Well, I mean, she's, she's, a, she's an invaluable resource, intelligence resource for the United States. So if these folks are going down to Cuba, it makes sense for their, them to sit down with Her Highness and kind of get pick her brain about what she thinks about this and who do I, you know, mm-hmm. how do I care for what's here's my goal? How am I going to execute my mission? What do you think? And therefore, there's a collaboration with that. I mean, you know, 
We have that need to know. She was in the need to know to know who they were and what their mission was to help the greater cause of whatever the U.S. intelligence community was trying to do with that. So it makes sense. But uh, at the same time, there's a double-edged sword to that when you're talking to someone who's got uh, dual loyalties then, and you don't know that. It's disclosing you know, sensitive information. And, and the Cubans wrote to her that, you know, you remember what What's his name said, you know, we welcomed him with open arms. You know, they knew exactly who he was. They knew his real name, not his, you know, fake name. And uh, they knew exactly what he was doing. And therefore, everything he did down there, he was he was completely neutralized. He's safe. He's alive and well. I mean, he was when I talked to him after her arrest. But, you know, they knew exactly who he was and what he was trying to do. It was about teamwork, but she betrayed the team. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, that's a great way of saying it. It's yeah. A great way of saying it. Uh, and just before we kick it over to the audience, uh, so this is a statement that she put out uh, in the Miami. So this is the Miami Herald 2002. I believe our government's policy towards Cuba is cruel and unfair, profoundly unneighborly, and I felt morally obligated to help the island defend itself. And then this is from a statement she released. Uh, earlier this year. I encourage those who wish to focus on me to focus instead on important issues such as the US economic embargo against Cuba. Who in the last 60 years has asked the Cuban people if they want the United States to impose a suffocating embargo that makes them suffer? So the reason I read that out is because in 20 years, her position hasn't changed. Nope. She's unrepentant. It's she's She's stuck to the reason why she got into it? Yeah, she is. I mean, you know, the the unrepentantness is, is I, when she was in prison, felt that she was going to stick to that mantra. Because, you know, you do hard, it was, I visited her in prison and I was scared. Prison scared, I got scared straight. <laughs> and I was, I was one of the good guys, I guess. I mean, I was, I, I could leave whenever I wanted to. And it's scary. And I can imagine how, you know, having to stay there, it, how scary that is. Um, I thought that she needed to believe that, to continue to believe that, to get through that hard time. And then once she's free, she was going to have an epiphany and say, wow, well, that was a big mistake and let's go. Um, no, she's, she's continued with that. And I guess maybe, you know, I'm naive because 39 years of her life was – committed to that and if you say boy what a waste of time you know then, then you're the majority of your life is a waste you know so i think she has to stick to this thought process and if you noticed she's displacing responsibility it's the united states fault i had to do this you know the i not taking responsibility for your behavior it's really blaming someone else is what i hear in that so and I will say what's interesting is um, she's declined all media inquiries, including uh, a major news network, sit down. And she wants her privacy. She wants to live in peace, and that's all fine and dandy. But she released a photograph of herself. In case you haven't seen me in 22 years, here is what I look like. And I'm told that she, uh, she has claimed that she is uh, uh, spotted in San Juan and people come up to her and congratulate her and thank her for her service or what she did. And again, fits into part of why I'm trying to do this in a way that um, balances that heroicness of her. With that, I want to show a quick picture and talk about this. The Cubans shot down and murdered four people in February of 1996. And, and Anna, I don't believe Anna had advance notice that they were going to do this. Brothers to the Rescue is a, is a South Florida, Miami-based Cuban exile group that tries to help Cuban people. Unlike Anna thought what she was doing by helping the Cuban people, that was BS. These guys, occasionally they would fly into Cuban airspace. You know, they would, they would venture into Cuban airspace, which is not good. But in this day... They were flying over, uh, you know, international waters, looking for people trying to escape Cuba, really helping brothers, brothers to the rescue, helping brothers. The Cubans 
shot two planes down and murdered four people. This is a Saturday. Sunday, Anna is being pulled to the Pentagon to work this crisis. It's now an international crisis, obviously. And Ernesto, her legal officer, knows where she's going. They did not have a planned meeting, but he stands on the corner of Macomb Street and Connecticut, two blocks from the National Zoo. And he makes eye contact with her, and he, he gets her attention, and she pulls over, and he leans in, and he says, look, we know where you're going. Everything that you learn about what we did and how you're going to respond, the United States is going to respond, that's of intelligence value to us. We need to know. We need to meet. This was, in my mind, a pivotal moment for Anna. Say what you want about espionage. And I obviously have my own views. But, but now you, you're conspiring with people who have murdered Americans. And instead of saying, you know what, you guys went a little too far on this, I'm taking a knee. Call me in a couple weeks. We'll get back to doing the normal. But this is, this is too far. And that's not what she said. She said, when and where. So that's her squad, people that murdered American citizens. That's who she aligned herself with. And that's who she is. And that's part of what I want people to know. Mm -hmm. that, that after the fact, she had no problem helping murderers of Americans. Well, let's go over to the audience for questions. Um, any takers? <laughs> I'm going to ask Pete what I asked him right before, which was, why didn't she get more time? It's a great question, legitimate question. You know, the, the, the most sensitive information we had would never see the light of day. The government in this case, in, in many of these espionage cases, a lot of the original predication is top secret. Uh, it's now not, and it, I went through the right process, but we, we definitely tend to not want to take top secret information into court and declassify it. There are other equities involved. Venue was an issue. We, were, we tried her. Uh, she was arrested out of, of D.C. versus Northern Virginia. And Northern Virginia has a little bit, the Eastern District of Virginia maybe has a different prosecutive perspective on things. D.C., you know, um, probably would not have executed or, or had a death penalty case against a woman who was spying for Cuba even after 9-11. So we thought venue was a challenge. So then you start negotiating. Hanson, uh, we negotiate from, you go to trial, you're, we're going to go for the death penalty because you had blood on your hands. And we were ready to prove that, we the U.S. government. So you know, I'm assuming the CIA was ready to go into court and say, I'm John Smith, I worked for the CIA, and I recruited that guy, and now he's dead. They were ready to present that case. So when you're negotiating with Hanson, it's death or life, your choice. So with Anna, the best we could do at trial is life. And a life sentence for someone who's 45 years old, whose mother is still alive at 88, is probably 45 to 50 years. I don't know. So then you start negotiating down. So we come up with a number 25, and um, you know I do have regrets that I couldn't have done more to prove and found evidence that was got us 30 years or 35 years had more leverage. I mean, her walking around, I respect the plea, but it 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 does bother me because she is just as bad as Hanson and Ames and Walker, all three of whom, you know, two of them are dead, and Alder Gaines will never walk out of prison. So. It's a negotiation. There's give and take. Um, we had things that we had to learn from her. If we went to trial, we could lose. So there's a lot of motivating factors here. If she went to trial, she could lose and spend the rest of her life in prison. So the number 25, I swear, I came up with that number. I threw it out there. And the reasoning was I had to get out of the FBI before she got out of prison. <laughs> and no, I'm not making any correlation between working for the FBI and being in prison. <laughs> Maybe a little. <laughs> Ian? Pete, thanks. Um, you mentioned that part of your motivation for the book was to kind of prevent another Anna Montez, and yet, unfortunately, some of the stuff keeps on happening. And you also mentioned that early on in your FBI career, there really wasn't any training to teach you kind of how to do what you were going to do. So to what extent do you think we need a better theory of counterintelligence to guide effective practice? And if Pete Lapp were king for the day and king of the, the CI community, what would you change about our CI posture? What would you change about our counter-espionage strategy? It's a great question. And I think, you know, I, 
Malcolm Gladwell in his book, Talking to Strangers, kind of talks about, you know, Bernie Madoff and how he's happy that Bernie Madoff happened and how he's to a degree, because he talked about him and Anna in the same chapter. Um, he's happy because we default to trust. And what kind of life would we all be living if an Angleton, you know, James Angleton at the CIA, you know, destroyed the CIA for a long time because he created such a level of distrust. Everyone, there was a spy behind every tree. And there's not. There's a spy in every woods, but maybe not a spy behind every tree. So if we create this paranoia, who's going to want to work for the, the government and work in the intelligence community and go through the clearance process and have maybe, you know, as part of my king for a day, we've got all of our personal emails of folks that work, that have clearances. We're all being monitored by Big, Bro big Brother. I'm not signing up for that gig. I'm not going to go work for the FBI or CIA if, if, and having that degree of, of scrutiny. We've got to have some level of trust with the workforce that we bring in. But we've also got to have an ability to vet better and get a better understanding of, of who those folks are that are doing this. And, you know, my, my issue with, with, with the Cuban program and I'm not just saying this for the FBI. I'm saying this across the board. You know, the news broke about the ambassador's arrest, and it was a big story. And now it's, now it's fading quickly. And I guarantee you if this was Russia or China, if this was the FBI, if this was the CIA, this story would not go away for a long time. And it's already fading. Because people don't give the respect to the Cuba Intelligence Service and the Cuba program, it's always China, Russia, China, Russia, China, Russia. Guess what? The Cubans are using that to their advantage, and they're kicking our asses. We're lucky we're getting back at them, but they are really good. And we, we all, we all in the U.S. government suffer from a lack of putting prior, you know, priority to Cuba as a counterintelligence threat. And I think it's been a disservice to, that's part of why they've been so good over the years. I mean, and I speak from my own personal belief. I mean, I wanted to get off that squad as quick as possible and go work the cool stuff, you know, and not Russia or China, go work bank robberies. Or So my, my hope would be to inspire people to want to go to the FBI, go into public service, go into the FBI, and go want to work counterintelligence as opposed to being forced to go work that. Go inspire somebody to go, wow, I want to do that. Where do I do that versus where do I how, where do I sign up to go work bank robberies or you know drugs because that's really anybody can do that stuff. Mm -hmm. Is it is it true? Did the State Department uh, make their senior staff like ambassadors uh, go through the polygraph? I don't believe so. The State Department is very uh, polygraph adverse in in my and from my understanding. I mean, Anna. Look at Anna. You know, Anna starts in 1985. Her first and only polygraph was 1994. Only one, 17 years, nine, you know, nine years in. And, and she was, you know, it's three years before she got read into that NRO program. But, like, she had access to highly classified information. I myself got polygraphed coming into the FBI, and then they, and my number wasn't called for another 12 years. Now, don't worry. I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm trustworthy. There's no reason to not, but like so my own self, I mean, 12 <laughs> years, like, you know, why wouldn't we're supposed to do it every five years and thus, but she beat the polygraph anyway. So, I mean, and after Anna, they brought in a cushion that you had to sit on so that you couldn't clench your sphincter muscles to beat the polygraph. That's correct. Right. Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes. The human body, by the way, has like 300 <laughs> different sphincter muscles, but one in particular, she, she, and yes, now there's a electronic whoopee cushion that you sit on so that you can't wow. do that. It's the Montez, the Montez chair. <laughs> <laughs> but I also believe that, you know, there was, there was things she did during the polygraph and all we have is a final report. We don't have the graphs to kind of do a quality control, unfortunately. Um, I believe that she was very good at relaxing herself. And, you know, here's the question. Are you committing espionage? It's a yes or no answer. And for her, I think she said no. In her mind, I think she rationalized, I'm not committing espionage, I'm helping my friends. You know, I think she was able to rationalize 
her reaction and her justification for it that probably helped aid her in getting through the polygraph that one mm-hmm. time. So? All right, Pete. You mentioned a couple times how good the Cubans are, and you also mentioned how Anna was well-liked in the Cuban-American community and the intelligence. Um, it's well known the anti-Castro movement is a recruiting ground for U.S. intelligence. Do you think pretending to be a, a card-carrying member of that community contributes to the success of the Cubans? No. Um, Elena, who worked in NSA, who uh, was like Nancy Drew, is Cuban-American. And Anna Maria Mendoza, who was our program manager at FBI headquarters of this case, who was, was a peer of Steve and I and, and other folks, Cuban-American. Um, those two individuals had far more passion than either Steve or I combined because they grew up, were born in Cuba, knew you know, every day they woke up, they knew their why. Why am I going to work? I'm going to work to fight against Castro, who, who changed my country's life and the, the course of our, our, our lives. So those folks are even more passionate than, than those of us that grew up in Jersey to be honest with you, about Cuba. And, and therefore, we need folks like that to come in. Um, Anna was not well-liked interpersonally. She was really, uh, her own ex-boyfriend at the time, her boyfriend at the time, who's now, they're obviously next, he called her the ice queen of Cuba. I mean, this is a guy who was dating her, you know. <laughs> so, like, She's not someone who's a warm and friendly person, highly respected as an analyst in terms of her skills, her competency, but not a lot of people actually really enjoyed working with her, and I can absolutely attest to that. But I think we need to hire folks that come in from all different varieties and backgrounds, and it enriches what we're trying to do. The perspectives that they bring is just tremendous, and, uh, and I think we need that. No, I mean, I guess I'm asking just pretending to be anti-Castro. Does that make it easier? I mean, does, does that make it easier for Cuban intelligence? You know, it's, oh, I hate Castro. Does that, you know, does that give them a, a, a hand in doing what they do so well? Um, well, Anna would not have come out and said, I'm anti-Castro. I, don't, I think she would have kept her feelings of Castro in Cuba muted to a degree, so I don't think she would have portrayed or pretended to be an anti-Castro. I don't, I don't know that I can um, agree with your, your premise on that, to be honest with you. I look at, you know, at the Washington field office, not, not even two miles from here, there's a wall of spies, the mugshots of, of all these spies that the Bureau has arrested in the Washington field office. And I see a whole lot of white guys, a whole lot of baby boomers, and a whole lot of non- non-Hispanics, non-Asians who the FBI has arrested over the years for espionage. So, you know, I don't think we can kind of focus in on one or two particular groups. Um, you know, we have so many Cuban Americans that have done great things to make our country better. I don't see that as a reasonable tripwire, if you, if you will. Well, That's just I my mean, opinion. So, 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 sorry, I think uh, hey. we, we need to leave time for other people. And, uh, yeah, I'm just thinking if you apply that same uh, logic, uh, both Kendall Myers yep. and Anna Montez used the the red train in DC, so uh, you know there could be a correlation there. Uh, Ma'am, hi. Um, I am Puerto Rican, and I do work for DOJ. Um, I just wanted to ask you about the it's a good question and i think that you know you look at it from the perspective of anna to the united states is seen as a traitor and anna to cuba is seen as a hero um, the three guys that started the whole story for us were Cuban intelligence officers who defected. Well, two of them defected. One of them went to jail, uh, a Cuban jail. And they think they are traitors, and we should look at them as American heroes. I think, you know, to answer your question, we do – those spies that are working for the United States overseas in a variety of different places are doing things for – 
the United States is national security. And, and yeah, I do believe that that's right and it's wrong to spy against us. And I understand that there's maybe um, a, a difference of opinion on that, to be honest with you. I do think spying for us in other countries helps make our country better and helps others throughout the world. But that's just, I mean, that's my opinion given, you know, my service at the FBI for, for 22 years. Isn't that a double standard now? Um, I don't think it is. I mean, I think it, there's a right and wrong. And I, in my opinion, no. I think, you know, that they're providing us intelligence, you know, makes our country safer. And, and I think that's, 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 I mean, that's my opinion. Others can disagree, but. Would you be a spy? Would I be a spy for whose side? <laughs> for the U.S.? Uh, if I was in another country, would and you join the CIA? I got no. no I, think, I think what you're asking. Let, let's say I worked in Cuba, born in Cuba, worked in Cuba. Would I spy for the United States? That's a hypothetical that's really hard for me to answer. I I would think. I see. I think I'm the kind of guy that would do that, kind of person that would do that. But that's a really interesting hypothetical question that I'm going to have to ponder because I've never really pictured myself <laughs> as under the only foreign country I'm from is. Jersey. <laughs> so I mean, it really is a foreign country. I can say that because I was born there. So I don't. I don't know if I. I've never really thought of it from that perspective. I have to. Thank you. Think on that. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, last question, sir. I noticed um, Anna Montes had a real fast track career, making you know GS fifteen and seventeen years. Looking back, were her supervisors and managers at DIA, DIA feeling like they they really missed something when they picked out this as a person who should be on the career fast track, and then you find out. She's a notorious spy. Did they feel as though that, you know, there was some huge red flag that, that they really missed? Her boss, uh, direct boss, said that um, she was his best analyst. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I think that when something of this, hap this magnitude happens, it, it takes a lot of guts for someone who worked over her to come out and say, yeah, you know, I had my suspicions about her. Um, and then because the next follow-up question is, and you talked to who about those suspicions? So the grain of salt is, is the, the caveat is, you know, I'm not sure that we get the whole truth. But, you know, I think that most people, and my friend Randy Furson here will, 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 you know, knew of her professionally. And I won't put words in your mouth, but I think you thought very highly of her, my friend, as, as an analyst and her skills. Oh, oh. Um, I'll tell you what you're supposed to say. <laughs> no, it's um, it's uh, it's a mixed bag, but I don't think I, I don't. There's not many people I came across that look at her after the fact and said, ah, I knew mm. that's that's been my what my research and my my understanding is. But Randy, so, by all means, I apologize for being late. Traffic did not help. Number one, I was a national intelligence officer for Latin America, 96 to 2000. And 2000 is when they really took off with the investigation. She worked for me part-time doing projects and whatever. So I got to know her pretty well as an analyst. Her ability to compartmentalize was phenomenal, which is why she was so successful. Is this, this working? Yeah. I had no clue whatsoever that, in fact, I was being told she was about ready to come work permanently over in the National Intelligence Council and move, move up, which, was, which is in the book. The good news is that my deputy was a chief of station. He had no clue, so I didn't feel bad. I said, okay, if the DO can't figure it out, I don't have to figure it out. But I wanted to make a couple of comments. Was, the first one was I wanted to reinforce your point about how good the Cubans were. And this is why I kind of wanted to say something. We had, after she was in the process of being arrested, but she was, we weren't aware of her, but, well, anyway, we knew, it was, I think it was after she was arrested, we had an intelligence community meeting. It was before she was arrested, I'm sorry. But we had a, a meeting of all the Cuban experts to go work on a special project. And we kind of, and this, you're right, it's good, it was before you got her. And we kind of looked around the table, and we said, what are the chances, I asked the question of, I was running the meeting, what are the chances that someone around this table is a Cuban plant spy? Raise your hand. 80% of them raised their hand. That's scary. 
I mean, the people who really knew Cuba knew how good they were. And they actually said, someone in this room that I'm looking at right now, that Cuba's supplanted here. I think there's an 80% chance. So the question is, how many, do you, how many of you would have thought that? I mean, that's, that's kind of, so the other question I have, if there's anybody in this room who's a Cuban agent, can you raise your hand? Hmm. <laughs> we can kind of see something. So the other the last point, this is a really good book from a guy who knows how to critique books. There's a style in Pete's writing which is really crisp and entertaining. I mean, I got through it in one and a half days, but I read a lot fast. And what I like is if you want to know how hard it is to catch a spy, everybody thinks it's so simple. And you get to see all of the pain that goes into the bureaucracy. And what I like, you see all the controls, all the things that make sure that you're obeying the Constitution, that you're protecting people's rights, just protecting people's, the other case that you didn't talk about, yep. for some strange reason, it was my favorite case, is the amount of energy that just went into trying to get medical records. Yep. It took six months just to get one medical record. You know, so you get to see a, a view of everything that's involved in what Pete was doing and how they pulled this thing together. <clears throat> So I, I highly recommend it. If you haven't read it, you need to get it, and you're not going to forget it. Well, thank you. And let me, let me say this, and I appreciate you, you teeing that up. Um, this book was made so much better that I could have written it by myself with two people, two women. Kelly Kennedy, my co-writer, who is... Who was a, amazing. I could, I could see her touch. Ass. So her job was really hard. As my co-writer, she couldn't write in her voice. She had to write in my voice. And I, it took me a while to figure out what my voice was going to be. So she had to write as if these words were coming out of Pete Lapp's mouth. And I, this book was so much better with Kelly's input and arcing and how she, she laid out the story. Um, how she made me look at the fact that Anna met in public which blew our minds during the debriefing, but we're thinking of it from a security perspective. She's meeting at lunch for two to three hours with her illegal officer handler, committing espionage in broad daylight. And as a dumb FBI agent, I'm sitting there going, well, that's really stupid. And she's helping me go, you're missing the woman aspect to this. She's isolated from relationships. This is her emotional intimacy. This guy sitting across the table, it's completely platonic, but he knew more about Anna than her own mother did, her own siblings. And that was the only emotional intimacy that she had. So Kelly helped me open my mind to how this looks from a woman's perspective. And then Amanda, my significant other, the reason I've softened a little bit about this, Amanda wasn't around during the, during the case, but her fingerprints are all over the book. She helped me understand that we're all complicated individuals. You know, none of us are all good or all bad. And, and, and showing this gray area and in, enlightening me to that, you know, we all have a little bit of gray in us really helped this story be even much more better than it was in my head, all jumbled up. So, Kelly and Amanda, thank you so much for, for your input and helping with this because this is all, that team effort is, is, is right there. So well, just I want to wrap up. <clears throat> if you go through the book, there were five extremely well-crafted zingers. <laughs> and you kind of sit back and you read that and it's, whoa, that's cool. The way that was written, what is it, I don't, I'm not sure which one it came from. But it's, and you don't see that in books. You read it and say, whoa, this is really, and it just pops right out at you. And you well, say, I, this guy thinks strange, but he's right. <laughs> peculiar. Well, yes, well, peculiar. I think, peculiar. <laughs> well, I think that that homage to Pete and his book is a good place to close out. So, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Pete Lapp. We also want to applaud Andrew. Excellent interview. 